All right, so let's get started. Boom. Hello, hello. I had to, <clears throat> I had intended on starting earlier than that, not letting the intro go that long, but I had to get a couple things ready. It, it never ceases to amaze me how much you have to uh, move stuff around or do random things before you start one of these streams. Uh, I don't think many people are tuning in these days as far as like live anyways, which is totally cool, obviously. I don't about me in the slightest uh, i'm kind of putting these out the, out there to be like in perpetuity so i figure i'll just like talk about new ideas every day um you know things that might help people out uh because that is kind of what i'm here for so i figure we talk about two big subjects today uh one being uh picks <clears throat> now i've just recently switched back like i've gone all around i have got to wait the software's gonna drive me nuts i've gone all around with picks uh, everything from, uh, you know, starting out with just the straight up regular orange Dunlops. I think they're .7s. I've got a whole tackle box here full of picks that I'm going to use today to illustrate these ideas. But um, let me find one of these here. They're actually .6s. I use these for the longest time. Uh, just the straight up regular old Dunlops, which, you know, to be fair, there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, and I switched... I don't know that I have any. Oh, I do. I switched to these for quite a while. Because what's funny is, and we'll talk about it at length here in just a little bit. What's funny is I found that they bent in the same place every time, which was really nice. It, it gave me the, the expectation of exactly, you know, how I was going to lean into it and what it was going to, like, how it was going to respond to me leaning into it when I, when I did dig the pick in, right? <clears throat> what's funny is I made this decision based off of one simple fact. Back in the day when I was emulating Paul Gilbert's technique, I figured, well, why wouldn't I use the same pick that he's using? And so that's what I did. And he, at the time, was using these picks right here. Uh, I got a job at a music shop, and they had these picks, and I tried it out, and I was like, oh, my gosh. That is, it's, you know, and the funny thing is, these are, I think these are meant to be, they're called star picks. I don't know if it'll focus on that. They're called star picks, though. Um, and I think the, the reason, the way they market these, at least, is that you would, you'd have a better grip. You can grip your finger through the pick. But the way that I hold it is a little bit lower, slightly, slightly lower um, and not so centered in the, on the pick. So it really doesn't serve that purpose for me in my own uh, picking style and endeavors. So what it does though, is when I go to, when I go to dig into it, you can see the pick is definitely bending, right? But it bends right on that center line between those two, um, like these two, uh, pointy bits here every time, right in the same spot. Uh, the bottom won't really bend, uh, given that the t you know, if you're holding, if you're holding the pick slightly up here, the bottom's not bending. It's still bending in my fingers, which I found was much more consistent. And it's funny because that's kind of Ingve Malmsteen's whole argument. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have seen that video. I'll pull it up real quick. Uh, the Ingve interview. Let's see if I can pull up just that timestamp. Yeah, here we go. Somebody clipped it. Thank goodness. In 1983, Jeez. I came to Japan. What just happened? I just messed up some. Oh, gosh. Oh, I see. Golly. Oh, that's cool, though, actually. Sorry. This whole thing is getting out of hand here. I bumped my pick box. And things got a little cattywampus there for me. All right. So give me just a second here. I could probably bring this down. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me uh, let me get this going. Make sure it's not too loud for you guys and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, that should be good. Let me pull in. It's always a fun a fun thing to try to make everything work the way it should. There you go. I've been playing guitar for a long time by then. And the, the Japanese uh, interviewer goes, how do you hold your pick? And that was the first time that you ever thought I of even it. looked down on my hand. Right. Oh, like this. I never thought about it, but. So that's not, that's not the clip. I'm sorry. Give me a sec. See if I can find just that clip. Cause I don't want to uh, try to go through all of the the whole video it's a pretty long interview it's a really really great interview actually 
And so we can see what, I think it's a one millimeter Dunlop is what he says. Uh, and so he talks about, maybe I won't be able to find it. Maybe Rick was nice enough to give us timestamps. Uh, let's see. Ingve, well, jeez, I'm so sorry if that's loud for you guys. It sounded loud to me. Uh, no timestamps, but that's okay. Just gonna search through a little bit here. Oh, that, I found it instantly. It's right at the beginning. That's actually pretty, pretty great. Okay, um, let me just put this on. All right, so we can, so we can see here. They say, uh, when this hand, your brain controls this hand. And oh, this I, I went too to far. Meet. Sorry. And you use a really thick, like one point five, yes. one point one five. What is it? One point five millimeter Dunlop. Yeah. And tell oh. me why. Th Which is an extremely thick pick, uh, and I say extremely because for me and myself, I have I use the it's a point seven three right, and the most I'll ever go is one point zero. Uh, are picks mostly preference? Are they designed to play style in mind? That's a really good question. A really, really good question, actually. I appreciate you hopping in, my dude. Um, yeah, so I would say <clears throat> they're all preference, okay? But what's funny is that this preference seems to be tied to whoever you're inspired by, whoever you are trying to uh, pick like, right? So that's what I was just going over was for me, when I first started playing guitar, I didn't even think about it. I chose the 0.6 Dunlop in a way I went because I wanted to pick like Paul Gilbert. Uh, and I wanted to do the whole... I wanted to alternate pick everything I could. And so he talked about how the pick has a certain kind of like flack, uh, you know, especially when doing uh, other less uh, intricate things. Like so maybe something like that. And strumming, probably. That kind of thing, I can feel the pick give in the best way. Um, there's, it allows me to kind of like control uh, the dynamic even, even that much more. And I can get this like thwack on the string. Let me uh, get my camera to stop uh, focusing here. I forgot to turn that off. Sorry about that. This won't take but a second, and boom. Okay, so yeah, so I get this, I get this like thwack. I can kind of lean into the pick a little bit, and it gives that bend. I don't know if you can see that, but it gives that bend, right? However, if you go to a thicker pick, which I find that uh, a lot of really, really good alternate pickers, and I mean like the best of the best, and I think in, in our world right now, the best of the best is probably going to be uh, Stephen uh, Toronto or Taranto um, or uh, that guy Baxty, which I keep forgetting his name, but that's his handle on Instagram. Um, unbelievable pickers. Uh, but I, here's the thing, though, is that you never know how the size of these guys' hand or how big they are or, um, you know, the exact supination they're using, uh, which is just the, the angle of the wrist on the string, you know, which way, you know, these, these intricate things, right? Um, and so I, if, from my own experience, I think it's important. And that's kind of the whole premise of this conversation. I think it's kind of po important to try to do what you think feels best. At the end of the day, you know your desired goal, and that is for the sound to be what's in your head, right? Or the thing you're going for. Uh, and I think I, you know, you would need to try to think about that when going for all these things. So this is a Jazz 3, okay? And Jazz 3s are always the same size. I can't remember. I think it's like... Uh, 1.3, 1.14 something. It's over 1.0, okay, 1.0 millimeter, okay. Um, and uh, this has zero give, no give at all. This will not bend. Uh, you can bend it in your finger very slightly, uh, very very slightly, right? Uh, but doing that same thing I just did there. <laughs> You can hear I'm missing picks a little bit, right? For me, and this is not a boastful thing or anything, it's just the way that I'm built, uh, I have a very large hand. Um, I don't know what a good way, here's a here's a coffee cup, like a regular old coffee cup, right? And my hand's a little bit larger than the coffee cup. And uh, <clears throat> and I don't know, uh, that's just the way it is, right? So a lot of these guys though, they all use these Jazz 3. Same thing with Eric Johnson, they use a Jazz 3, he uses a Jazz 3, uh, and he gets great alternate picking. <laughs> But you can hear I don't have that same dynamic on the string. When I when I thwack the string, you know, the string just gets out of the way. Let's see what you, uh, I think I saw a video by him or someone else. They said they like the tone of their pick, and it's not scratchy. Yeah, uh, might be what exactly. No, 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 I didn't. I appreciate you bringing that up, man. These are really, really good points and conversations, and I, I appreciate you joining in here. 
but you know, you're so right, which leads me to my next point. I was working at the music shop at the time, a music shop in uh, Florida, and uh, there was a girl who started working there named Lacey, and she was a really good uh, guitar player too, but she played acoustic. And so we, we one day had, were talking, we had new guitars we were setting up, really nice uh, acoustic Gibsons uh, and Martins, and we were setting them up, and I remember we, play, we were playing stuff, and I had tried a new pick. Like I saw, this is the same thing, I had a .60 is what I was using at the time, but I had the same thing, but in Oltex, right? And so uh, if you yourself tried this out, you would instantly be able to see that the sound on the strings with the Oltex pick is much brighter uh, and much more uh, like chimey, uh, especially on acoustic guitar. It has this different sound. And as you're saying, the more uh, like subdued and muffled tone where the pick doesn't get in the way nearly as much would be something maybe like a nylon pick, which I think this is made out of, um, this, this is Tortex, which I suppose is supposed to emulate uh, tortoise shell, but it's really just like a, pla it feels like a plastic too. It doesn't feel like a um, anything specific, right? It feels close to a nylon pick. And the nylon picks have even a more subdued sound than, uh, than picks like this do, right? So if I played a passage, something like a... Right? If I play something like that and then did the same thing with the Tolex pick, or the, uh, sorry, the Oltex pick. Even through the amp and the distortion and stuff that I have set right now, uh, you can still hear that it has like a, a more chimey kind of like, uh, uh, like unique sound to it than that one does. Um, and of course, there's multiple components of this. I'm sorry, I feel like I have like a, a hair stuck on me. <clears throat> there's multiple components of this too, right? Not only are we talking about material, we're talking about uh, thickness and size, right? The Oltex, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the Oltex Dunlop versus the Jazz 3, there's a huge difference there, right? Uh, I definitely feel like I need to get my hand into the string more with the Jazz 3 or hold it higher up on the pick uh, to be able to do the stuff that I'm normally comfortable with doing. And for me, that's just not nearly as comfortable as something that's a little thinner and a little bit bigger. And I think you could definitely, at least at that point, hear that uh, that uh, chiminess coming through there in those alternate. Maybe we could do like a uh, something like a. And that'd probably be a good one to test right there. And this is the uh, orange one. Instantly, to me, sitting in front of the amp, I'm not sure how that's translating through, but this sounds much more subdued uh, than the uh, Oltex one does. And I think this might be nylon. I think these are nylon, so this is a good example of this too. Then. So that's harder for me. That's harder for me to pick too. I'm sorry. I don't mind my mistakes there, but um, I think I think now we're kind of uh, getting to that point where uh, you can see where we have a lot to select here. Uh, as far as like materials and stuff are concerned, <clears throat> I have a couple other picks too. Which let's go ahead and let let's let um, Rick finish his point here with Ingve real quick. Though you said this because you don't want any flexibility yes, in the pick. Yes, because if if the, be the pick bends, yep. you have two brain hemispheres. Yep. Okay. One controls this hand. One controls this hand. If you want to play something like, a, let's say, say a. When this hand, your brain controls this hand and this hand to meet in coordination, if there is a flexibility in this pick, it's going to be a latency of millisecond. So his, he surmises that your arms are controlled by different sides of your brain, right? Which I mean, may be true, uh, but it doesn't feel that way to me. Uh, in, in a sense, once we, as guitar players, get to the point where we can alternate pick and we, we we're able to sync our hands up together, it becomes one, I think. And I don't think about it like that. And so I would have to disagree with the master here uh, in a sense that I, myself, as I was talking about earlier, kind of like a little bit of bend because it allows me to kind of uh, get more of a thwack kind of going on. Uh, so no, and you're so right. Um, uh, so brighter tone is exactly what that is on the old text. And if that's why you're going, or so you you lean towards the Tortex, right? Which is the, these Tortex, these orange ones, right? Um, cause it sounds a bit closer to longer nails. I absolutely agree with that. I would suggest trying the old text if you haven't already, because to me, that's what the nails sound like. That's why I'm into it. Cause it has a brighter, like it has like a brighter kind of thing going on. I don't have super long.
And the nail's a little bit different because you're popping, you're popping the string out too, right? But just that sound. To me, that's that's a little bit more brighter than the uh, Tortex is. Right? Sounds a little bit closer to uh, nails, to me at least. Uh, but you know, as in the point Inve is making here exactly. about but thickness is he yeah. doesn't want yeah. it to bend because he doesn't want the he doesn't want to have inconsistency, right? And so my my thinking when I was uh, younger and I was just getting into these things was that this pick, the star picks. I don't know if you were in here earlier, but I was talking about the star picks right here. Are the same exact and I mean exact thing as the normal Tortex uh, Dunlop picks? They feel like the exact same material. They are the exact same shape. Uh, dead on that could be made in the same factory just have a stamp put in them, you know and put a different label on it <clears throat> And so uh, I, I don't know that for a fact or anything like that But the, it could be they feel that similar. Okay, uh, and the cool thing about this is these picks bend in the same place every time You're never gonna have the pick bend uh, Like at the bottom of the pick like just the bottom bending right? It's always gonna bend where that hole is and it's got these um, Like let me see if you can see that it's got these oh, it's not um, Like triangles right? And so at the tips of those triangles is where the pick's gonna wanna bend, right? And so that brings in consistency, right? The pick is bending, but it's bending in a consistent way, right? Uh, I've since moved off of those because I find the old text, even though, so like if you compared a 0.73 old text to a uh, 0.73 uh, regular Dunlop Tortex, to me at least, they feel like uh, this, this pick feels like it's much more rigid. And uh, what's funny is generally we contribute uh, rigidity of the pick, uh, the pick's ability to bend or not bend uh, on the thickness of the pick, right? I would say, however, that it seems to be dictated by the material of the pick uh, just as much as the thickness of the pick. So uh, the stamp may be a little more flexible. Those serrations make you bend it. Exactly. Yeah, man, exactly. And it's pretty cool, too. These are good picks. Don't get me wrong. I moved off them because I found, so I was for a while now, I'll show you the other one, too. I was, I've been going back and forth between three different picks. If I can find one of the right ones here, sorry. I was just, if you weren't in here before, I've got a whole tackle box full of picks here. Uh, I've been trying to go through. Um, and you know, I, I think that, and it's, it's important to say a lot, as guitar players, we're always trying to fix something that might not always need to be fixed. Uh, at least in my own, I don't wanna talk for everybody, you know, but at least in my own endeavors, that kind of seems to be the case. I tend to try to uh, be like, well, this guy's doing this, so maybe I need to do that, right? Uh, which is why I got on this whole little pick craze here. I'm really struggling to find one now. Oh, there we go. I got them all over the place, man. Sorry. Um, but we, we we tend to try to like emulate these things that you know, or make these like uh, good decisions, and uh, that might not always need to be made. Uh, and what I mean by that is you, you could see like, for example, when I, I saw all of a sudden learn that Steven, uh, Taranto, Toronto, uh, I'll, I always say two last names for him cause I still don't know how to say it. Um, but I found out he used a jazz three and then I found out Baxter used the jazz three because he was emulating him. Uh, it was one of those things that I was like, oh, well then maybe, maybe I should use a jazz three. But of course my giant hands, man. And that's, again, it's not a boast. It kind of sucks sometimes. Uh, I have a, I wear a size 15 and a half shoe as well. It, like, it's not a fun thing sometimes when you, you know, you can't go find your shoe in the store or, you know, you can't play the same pick as the guys you're trying to emulate because your hand's too big and gets in the way or the pick gets swallowed in your fingers. <clears throat> that being said, you have to find what works best for you, uh, and that's kind of my the point of this lesson. So I, I for a while before I've, I came to that that I, that idea, I for a while was trying to use the uh, this is a um, um, Jazz Three XL, but it's in the old text material, right? Now it's purple because it's, it's one of the like the flow type of old text, but you know, old text is the same thing. They just started doing it in purple, uh, and this one is 1.4, which that's what the jazz size is. That's right, 1.4 is what the jazz size is. Uh, I've been having trouble getting a consistent rhythm when alternate when alternating because the pick seems to catch, and that's probably player error. Probably my pick. So listen, that's not you know. Don't get me wrong. I, it, it very well may be uh, player error as well. I mean, you always have to attribute something to that. However. Um, it's important to realize that sometimes it's not, right? A good example of this is, for whatever reason, it might just be because it's like the first thing I really got into and it's what I got used to at first, I find myself not getting caught. And I know that feeling of getting caught um, between the strings, right? Obviously that can be attributed to escape angle, right? If you're not escaping. Uh, and I'm not sure it says, uh, I'm just calling you me. I think means a good name. I don't want to pronounce that whole thing because then all of a sudden I've said something uh, that I haven't thought about. Um, you know, that might just be your name, which uh, no offense. But also, uh, you know, you 
if you haven't been in here before, I really, I harp on uh, pick angle uh, and escape motion and two-way pick slanting and things like this, all these all these words for these things in most of my streams. Uh, the reason why is because I think for alternate pickers, that's the most important thing and the most important piece of information that's come out uh, in a long time, Troy being uh, you know somebody who will go down in the history books, in my opinion, for that kind of thing. So uh, when you go <clears throat> and you're doing your pick angle, right, and you're doing ascending, I think, and, I, and this is something that I've kind of come to my own ideas about is that when you're doing your own uh your own playing and you're ascending right and when you're ascending you generally have to have a downward pick angle and the reason why at least you need to come to a downward pick angle uh to be able to escape the string on an upstroke right uh, and the reason why we do that is it's the same kind of reason we do it when we're sweeping down right we need to have the pick not get caught by the string we can't sweep this way right and so when i'm doing three note per string at least and i'm doing three note per string scales if i did something like in uh c major a minor here <laughs> You can see that I'm jumping. I'm catching the new string on upstring there, but then I have to come right back to my downstroke here. On an ascending uh, pattern like that, that's three note per string, it seems to be much easier to consider the, the strings as groups of notes. Once you get done with this group of notes, right, and you're going back to the down, you kind of are moving your hand a little bit to get to that next one, which is helping you kind of approach it the same as you would. Like, so if I play it all the way up, I'm playing all. I'm trying. I'm doing this group, then this group, and then this group, and I'm considering it to be that way. So that starts on a downstroke every time for those. But the main thing is switching to that upstroke on the new string. Something like that. Oh, Leroy, my bad. You got a totally different name, my guy. Uh, damn, dude. I'm so sorry, man. I won't forget now. Uh, good to talk to you, bro. Um, yeah. No, it's all right, bro. Don't worry about that count. <laughs> well, good. Now I know who I'm talking to. That's really nice. So consider this, okay? If you're getting caught in the string, as you're saying, that's really good that you know that the pick angle thing already, man. That's really nice. Uh, you know, consider this. Try to do the lick that I just did. Start, do a downward pick angle first, okay? Um, and I mean, what I mean by that is upward escape, okay? So the string, when I pick down with, on a downward pick angle, I'm in the string. When I pick up, I'm out of the string. It's opposite if I'm doing the downward pick angle, or I'm sorry, the upward pick angle. Uh, downward, the down motion is going to escape up motion is going to go into the guitar and in between the strings, okay? Um, start with the downstroke or start, you can start either way you want to, but force it to only change the string on the stroke you're practicing, okay? So maybe something like, maybe take that same lick, just C major, A minor, and do the Paul Gilbert thing with it, where we go to the next string, do the upstroke, and then go all the way back through it. So up four, one, two, three, four, down, and then back up six. That, that kind of thing uh, will help you uh, get used to that, right? And then do the same thing when you're descending. <clears throat> a really good descending lick uh, is the Paul Gilbert Sixes lick. Uh, and the reason why is because you have to catch every new string on an upstroke, and you're still practicing escaping the strings on that downstroke. You, you have to escape on a downstroke. I ha you see, I have to go into the string here, and I have to escape with that downstroke to be able to get that new string on an upstroke, okay? So take these two and use them back and forth. Uh, uh, and then maybe you can do uh, just all the way up and down. Like uh, I gave another lick before that was like a, I'm oh, sorry, oh, what was it? I gotta think about it now, sorry. Uh, that's not right. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, okay. That... No, I want to think of something that's easy on the hand, so we don't have to change positions. Uh... That, that should be fine. That's not that big of a deal. Uh, you can keep using your middle finger too, which is nice. Um, so try this one, uh, and I've given this lick before. I think this is a really useful one uh, when you're thinking about downward pick landing. And upward, I mean, trying to, sorry, two-way pick slanting, because you'll see my hand has to change every time, because I'm picking, you know, the first string is called an upstroke, but then the second string has got to be a downstroke, right? Which means that I have to upward pick slant to be able to get out of the string. Uh, I think that's a good one to use uh, to try to get used to that, right? 
Um, and so back to our little pick talk here. Uh, this this is my chosen pick. And again, it's not really because I ch I myself was like, yes, that's the pick I want to use, right? It just seems to me that this one for me is more consistent in that same feeling of when I get to the top. <laughs> my own playing and the stuff that I like to do feels like I'm much less trapped and my pick angle uh, is much more natural feeling to me. I don't have to make a conscious effort about, oh, I need to really make sure I'm over the string there. I need to really do this. Um, every other pick I use uh, seems to be a little bit different for one reason or another. Um, you know, and this is pretty much the same exact thing as your standard Dunlop shape, which, you know, there's, there's credence for you know, that's the shape I grew up on. I think most guitar players probably start with a pick that's very similar to this, right? Uh, and so maybe that's just what I'm more comfortable with because that's what I've always used and that's what I develop my picking around. Uh, and it kind of is muscle memory, so it, or it is muscle memory for sure. And so I guess it's kind of unchangeable. So switching to another pick might change that. However, I've been trying to, I've been frankly beating my head against the wall trying these new uh, flow picks. Um, this one is a uh, prime tone is what it's called, right? And this one closely mimics the size of the Dunlop as well, though it is slightly, slightly different. The shoulders are a little bit taller or a little bit wider, uh, and the, the bottom seems to go just a little bit longer. It seems like it's just a little bit of a longer pick, right? And this one's okay for me. Uh, this one's not bad. It feels pretty normal. <laughs> thing is is and it's really nice it's got the it's uh old text as well only problem is it feels too thick man i have zero bend on the string and to ingve's point here uh in mr beato's uh interview of him he he that's what he's looking for i guess that's what he himself has developed his picking technique around is <clears throat> the expectation of it not bending right all the stuff he does what is, what's that lick he played uh, is that what he played? Something like that. Let's well, see. So let's see the his, what this, the demonstration he gives for this. this hand, one controls this hand. If you want to play something like, a, let's say, say a. So he's uh. So he's doing one extra, one extra pick. Uh. He's just, something like that. For me, I feel like I'm rolling over the string a little bit too much. Um. And it's like the string just gets out of the way. So for me, and again, I'm not taking away from this. This is the master here that we're talking about, Ingve Malmsteen, right? Sitting in front of another master <laughs> talking about uh, things that are beyond me, uh, you know, beyond my ability at least. Uh, this, this kind of thing here, uh, for myself, I look for the string to kind of give me uh, some pushback on my pick uh, to a degree, which allows me to control the dynamics a little better. It feels, that feels much more um, controlled and consistent to me than the other pick did. This pick feels like I don't know, uh, it does, I can't feel how the, the velocity I'm really hitting the strings at. I'm kinda, it's kind of a guessing game for me. So it's hard for me to be able to judge that. See, I get stuck a little bit there with that one, it feels like. Uh, whereas uh, with this one. Maybe I'll keep that on. It feels like I'm less stuck between the strings with this one. Uh, which is an interesting thing because, and I don't know what else to attribute it to. It's the same material, almost exactly the same shape, but it's just thicker. This one's 1 1.0 and this one's 0 0.73. And so I think that's what it is for me. And so I, I, I'm here to give credence to the people who use slightly thinner picks. I couldn't ever use like a really thin pick though. I've uh, some of those ones that like instantly move out of the way. feel like there's too much flop in them. Uh, and the time it takes for them to get back is too long to get back into the next one at the speed that I want to pick. Um, but I suppose this one is right in that wheelhouse. But um, I also was trying to uh, – uh, wait, would you, uh, is it possible to use a – I'm so sorry I didn't see this, buddy. Is it possible to use a brighter pick? The clear one is kind of tough to see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the Ultex Dunlop. That's what you're talking about, 
right? This is the one that I've been using, uh, which is the brighter pick for sure. You should check this out because it's Ultex. The material Ultex is brighter sounding uh, in, in my own, especially, so I would tell you, just go to a music shop, okay? And take a regular, a regular old or even better, a nylon pick. The nylon picks sound even more muted uh, in my experience and in my opinion. Uh, but this Ultex one, Use a brighter pick for the clear one. It's kind of oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I don't think they make these in different color. I do like that these are purple, though, man. You drop this on the floor, it doesn't disappear nearly as well as this one does. Um, but yeah, so take it in there and just try it out. And you see, you'll see this one's instantly brighter, though, which is pretty cool. Uh, not color wise, but sound wise. <laughs> so, anyways, after I did, I have been trying to use, I tried to use the uh, Dunlop the Jazz 3 XL, which as it compares to the regular Jazz 3, isn't like a ton bigger, uh, but it definitely feels like it is. That that little bit at the bottom there, uh, to me, makes a pretty big difference. Uh, but I had such a hard time with it being as sharp uh, as it is. It feels like it's really cut away uh, differently than my other, uh, what I was used to, which is the old text, which has a little bit of a hip on it. It seems like... <laughs> And it also chirps the strings. I really can't stand that chirping sound. Uh, it drives me nuts. Right? Um, that instantly to me is noticeable in something like what we just played, right? I'm hearing that chirping sound every time as it compares to my regular old text. There's nothing there, right? Um, and so this was this was like pretty much instantly out from you, regardless of shape or anything like that. Uh, and I feel, and to me at least, it feels like all large picks that are over a uh, millimeter are like that. Yeah, and the surface exactly the surface area is quite different too, because you have more, way more to grip onto with this uh, with this uh, XL. Uh, it doesn't see really seem like that. It doesn't seem like it's too much on the camera there now that I'm looking at. It, but when you grab these in your hand, it feels way different. Um, I don't know. Let's see if I can get that a little bit better there. You can kind of see the purple. Uh, it's got like probably like a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit less, like a, a little bit less than that, eighth an inch or so, uh, all the way around it. And this is the Eric Johnson one, which I think is what most people are using that same exact shape. Uh, but yeah, so um, again, this one was what was a close contender, but again, it just felt too thick to me, and I'm still playing it every once in a while. Uh, but the one that was like the in between for me was the 1.0 Flow, right? Uh, this one is similar in size area wise to the um the dunlop the regular old dunlop right it's very similar except for it's almost jazz three like when it comes to the bottom of it with a little bit of a wider hip it's oops shoot uh you know very pointy in that way and this one was pretty good for me at first because i felt like i as i was going over the strings it was easier for me <laughs> It felt easier to me, um, you know, or at least I had convinced myself that it was easier for me to get in and out of the strings due to the fact that it's got that li it's cut away just a little bit there. <laughs> uh, you know, and it still feels like it's okay to me. Like it's not bad. Uh, but every time I go back to this pick, like I'll convince myself that, and I'll put nothing but this. I'll, I'll go to I'll go to the school to give my lessons for a month or so with only this in my in my pack uh, to use every day, right? And then when I come back to this one, it always feels like home to me for some reason. And I don't know why, but you know, I surmise that it's just because it's what I've used for so long. Uh, but this, the whole point of this uh, talk here, that's the scratchiness we were talking about. I don't, yeah, you, oh, you like the, so scratchiness, you meant the, 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 the chirpy sound, that chirpy sound on this, on the string. Because I think the scratchiness can come from, as you say, pick angle, right? Uh, if you're hitting the pick on, it, with any pick at least, if you're hitting the pick on a flat angle to the strings versus like a 45, you can get that scratch, right? Oh, 
Oh, the chirp. Okay, so if you're going for the chirp, yeah, you definitely need a thicker pick for sure. Uh, I would say to try, because so this one I'm using here is 1.4. This is a, um, uh, what did I say? It was Jazz uh, Jazz 3 XL. Uh, you should give it a try. And of course, you can get it in uh, old text as well, which is really cool, right? Uh, and so that chirpy sound would come from that. <laughs> And so this is at least you're proving my point though, right? That um, you know we all have our own likes and dislikes of all of these things, right? And that's what you should lean into. And also, at the end of the day, you're the one that's going to have to be playing and listening to it the most, right? And so you should inevitably try to uh, find something that you're you're tuned into, right? <laughs> You know, and so for me, I like the sound of this one better, right? I don't have that chirp in between each one, but for you, that chirp exists with this one, so that's the one you should go with. Uh, but give that a try, man. There's other ones too. Let me see here in my box of a million picks over here. Goodness gracious. Uh, there's other ones. So I'm pretty sure this is a nylon material, but I was using uh, the Swiss picks for a while. Now these are, um, there's, a, there's a give and a take with these, uh, I would say, that these are pretty much shaped like a Jazz 3XL. Uh, you know, more or less, they're a little bit bigger in the bottom, but they are, they, oops, shoot, that's hard to keep it on there. They are very close to a Jazz 3XL, hold it that way so you can just see it, right? Um, very close to it, uh, and they are a little bit different, than, not by much, than a uh, one of the um, regular old Dunlops. Uh, but they are, they are very sharp, and I can't remember the material they're made out of. Uh, I suppose it's probably some Tolex equivalent because uh, it doesn't feel like it's old text. It's got that. It's a little more muted. Uh, and I also think that the marketing with this one was uh, to just have better grip on it. Right. Uh, but when this when these came to me, you have to order these from a guy and uh, he sends them all out like I, or she. It could be a she. I'm sorry. Uh, but they, they make them and they send them out. Right. And then uh, it seems like they just stamp them out like they they have like a puncher. Right. And they punch them out of the material is what it seems like. And, you know, they sell those things. That's like what your your aunt would get you for Christmas or something, you know, based off the fact that she just figured out you play guitar. It's like, oh, I'll just let him make his own picks. He can make them out of credit cards, you know, uh, which nobody, you know, I don't think anybody really wants to do that uh, when they get to a certain level. Uh, but that's what these feel like is that they have like a tool they punch them out with. It's not a bad thing per se, uh, but it just feels like it's not quite as finished as some of the other picks. I say, uh, yeah, I just like the chirp, so I'll probably not like the small orange one. I got a couple of those at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree with that. You mean this one, the 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 Eric Johnson one? This one, I don't think it's a bad as bad of a chirp. It's definitely still there, but as it compares to uh, the old text one, which is more. That's a that's a much more significant chirp, in my opinion. Um, but the, the Swiss picks are pretty great. This is a 0.8, so it's a little bit bigger than um, the 0.73 that I was used to. But... but there's nothing that feels super different to me except for the fact that you're holding these bubbles that are raised up. They're pretty, they're pretty well raised above the above the pick there uh which for me is not super comfortable uh but some but to some people i could totally see that it was uh but it's also made out of either uh nylon or uh tolex which for me you know as i was discussing earlier i'm definitely an old text guy um i just like the sound that it has on the strings much better made them out of gamestop cards back nice also had a grandparent that sent me some made out of quarters which are cool but definitely not the best material yeah I, well you know and of course everybody would bring up to you that brian may played with a one pence uh, piece, you know, his whole career, that's what he plays with, right? Uh, so he's pretty much playing with a, uh, a a quarter or a penny or a dime or something, you know, whatever the size equivalent would be uh, to that, you know, and he's that's what he's doing with it, which is great, whatever, that's good for him. I don't really hear him trying to, you know, intricately alternate pick a bunch of stuff, though. So, uh, you know, maybe maybe his style is what's dictating that. But I also have to say, too, if you've ever seen the Guthrie uh, Govan picks, he has a, um, uh, at the top of the pick, I think it's like a dime or maybe I'm sure it'd be whatever the, the English equivalent is. Maybe it's a one pin uh, piece as well, but at the top, so he can get that, uh, that chirp on the strings by flipping his pick over and he does it. He can like, it's almost like a thimble um, or a piece of metal or something on the string. Uh, let's see if I can actually, I have a penny right here. I have a penny. So you can get that. Uh, that's what he's doing. So, and that he's got it built into the top of the pick, 
which is super cool. And so he can get that scratchiness, but it's like the, you know, the, the penny of course is, uh, uh, smooth on top, but the dime has slight ridges in it, uh, which is what it looks like that is a dime, or maybe the one pence has the same thing. Uh, and so he's able to, you know, he's, he's kind of getting a whole new uh, thing going on there by being able to do that, which is super cool. Uh, but, he, but again, he's not using it to pick the alternate picking stuff, right? He's using uh, a pick that's pretty regular. I think it's pretty much a jazz three is what it is uh, in thickness and in shape. Uh, but he's got that, he's got the the thing up top though, which is really cool, I think. Um, but yeah, these Swiss picks are cool, uh, but they just are, they're like, they're just like the regular Dunlops to me, uh, just with like some ridges in it is what it feels like. I wonder what a pick made out of sanded oyster shell. Oh, that'd be really cool, wouldn't it? That would make a really cool noise. It's interesting to consider those things too, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to like another degree of uh, guitar picks here where we're thinking more so in the lines of like sounds that the picks make themselves on the string as you play, uh, which I think is super cool because that's what the Old text does for me. Uh, the Old text uh, has like a, a brighter, chimier tone on the notes that I play and make things more, sound more clear to me than the more muted uh, nylon or Tolex does, uh, you know, so it's kind of in the same vein as that, I, I suppose. <laughs> Sounds so muffled. Like my amp, I feel like it changes as it gets heated up. Uh, it's like I find that it's it's much more trebly when it's not quite as heated up, and it gets heated up, and like the basin comes out like crazy. <laughs> Now the cool thing is, is this, uh, the chimey settings and stuff on your amp. Uh, and for me, what all, all I'm switching on and off, I have a, a, a JHS or it's a boss actually, uh, angry driver, which has the JHS, uh, angry Charlie on one side and the blues driver on the other side. And for me, the blues driver, I've always used it in a way, I always turn the tone down just a little bit cause it is a pretty bright pedal, but I've always used it in a way that was more so like to accentuate uh, the signal I already have, like it was always in like an always on pedal for me. Uh, and most of my amps, um, I have the, I have a, um, what's called a red remote, which is like, it's like a $30 little button that JHS sells that goes into the remote side of this. So I'll be able to like have more, uh, settings so I can actually turn the pedal all the way off. But as it stands right now, just the, the button I'm hitting just turns it between blues driver and angry Charlie. There's other settings where you can like put one into the other or the other one into the other one or both in parallel, which is uh, a really cool thing that you couldn't usually do just with a guitar pedal. Uh, but that being said though, uh, I usually turn on there. I had the angry Charlie on for almost all of that. Cause that's like my lead sound. I have it set to where it's a little more, uh, pushed. So like, you know, angry Charlie. <laughs> Right? And if I did the blues jar, I did the same thing. You see the... Less gain and more like uh, clarity, uh, which is really nice to have. The Angry Charlie is really nice to have for a lead thing. Oops. I find myself wanting more of that... Uh, smooth tone. With my lead stuff. Uh. And it's got this great harmonic content that comes out when I go to my bridge pickup. Too. I love it. Uh, but again, the blues driver, if you turn the blues driver side on, which that was all the angry Charlie, right? And I have this, 
I love this guitar, man. This ha it has DiMaggio's in it, right? It came with DiMaggio's. Uh, it's just a regular, uh, for all intents and purposes, I suppose it would just be a regular uh, Japanese-made uh, AZ 2402. Uh, the prestige, you know, the prestige 2402 versus the premium, um, and you know those those are all, or at least until now, those are all two humbucker guitars. They have a five-way switch, and then they have what's called like a Dyna Select or something like that, which does like a, a series parallel kind of thing. Uh, and I never, I own one of those guitars for quite some time, uh, and I never used that uh, pickup selector. I would do it as like a gimmicky kind of thing, but never in my own playing that I feel like it always sounded more like. Uh, muffled or honky than I intended it to be. Uh, and what's funny is this only has a three-way switch on it. I never have owned a guitar that has a three-way switch that I haven't changed uh, because I need to have those like split sounds. I need to be able to have a guitar that's at least versatile enough to allow me to get uh, a clean tone when I roll my volume back. And a clean tone on like a full uh, humbucker neck pickup doesn't really do it for me. Not really quite quite what I'm looking. It's too it's too uh, like muffly and too big, which is nice. Don't get me wrong. You know, you get that the jazz kind of thing. You know, it's, it's got a nice, it's got a nice honkiness to it, right? But being able to switch to this middle section here, which gives me the two inner coils, I get such a more stratty tone than I expected. Right? Volume's just a little bit, uh, just a little bit up. Uh, it's it's borderline Hendrixy. killer split tone and it's two humbuckers it's crazy man it reminds me of the blacktop strats they had a, a really cool uh four position sound but i've never used a three position before because i couldn't get that sound out of just the three switch so now i have full bridges which i love full neck which is awesome too obviously and then a split right in three switches you can't beat it man uh, I like Jackson because it's a nice clean tone, even though I find most people use it for metal. Yeah, so so what's the pickups you have in that Jackson? And which one is it? Is it uh, one of the... So I had a Japanese-made soloist that had uh, Seymour Duncan's in it. Uh, it had a It was Hum Single Single. And that thing had some really killer Strat tones uh, built into it. You know, on the, on the it was a five-way switch. On the four, uh, fourth position where it was using the neck and the middle pickup together, it would... It would extremely stratty uh but then you know uh neck pickup which i think it was like an sh something i can't remember the designation for the um uh seymour duncan pickups i always forget um all right let's get let's get rid of rick here Boop. and ingbe by extension i guess <laughs> i'm kind of i'm i'm enjoying this uh it's funny i haven't swapped the um the Swiss pick out, yeah, it's, it's got way more muted of a sound on the strings than the uh, old text does, though, you know. I don't know if you can hear it. Here's my microphone down here. You can hear the, the difference in just the pick. Right? You can hear, like, uh, a, oops, I'm so sorry. A certain, like, swish that's coming out there. And this is more of, like, a muted, like, uh, like uh, thwack, <laughs> which is funny to me. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot that will come through and a lot that won't come through. It's a lot of, like, uh, feel thing too for the player obviously though really brings out a nice um a nice like crispy sound it's like a, it's got this extra layer of uh trebliness at the top that's not too twangy but it brings it it's a, it's a nice little bit that brings out the top um all right oh dang we're already getting close to i gotta go probably about 11 40 or so maybe 11 45 at latest 
Um, so let's talk about approaching uh, solos. How did I put it in the title? What did I say in the title here? Because uh, I think uh, that's an Im I think that's one of the more important things to talk about too, and I'll talk about it more uh, as the time as I have more time uh, over the next week or so. Uh, what did I say? How to write a lead in an existing progression? That's really good. All right, so <clears throat> a good example for this for myself at least is I took Little Wing, and I kind of talked about this last time, but I don't think there's too many people who saw that, so I'll talk about it again. Uh, I took Little Wing, and I just wrote kind of like a string skipping uh, progression. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, but yeah, so Little Wing, if you don't already know how to play a Little Wing, uh, the progression is relatively, I don't want to say relatively simple. It's got a nice little walk down, a chromatic walk down, which you don't really see super often in like pop or rock music, which I think this this song fits right in that, or blues even, uh, fits in this nice. I mean, you might in blues, you have it through the flat five. <laughs> Right, and here we see uh, that same kind of things. So we're in E, and technically we're going from B to A, but we're doing it, which sounds different in the context, right? But generally, it really is just walking through the flat five of the key that we're in. But he's going to G major right after it, so it forces you to hear it as something else. I know that probably it might be a little confusing, but what I mean by that is generally the song is an E minor. Right, that's kind of what we're considering. G major being the same thing as E minor and vice versa. Uh, e minor coming from G major. Uh, if we're considering it to be E minor though, going from B uh, to A, chromatically would be the same thing as, right? But we're not considering that to be E minor there. We're considering that to be E major with a flat seven, which is kind of the bluesy thing, right? Uh, that's that kind of thing, right? But if we kind of swap those roles a little bit here and we consider, because we are very E minor, we do not bring a major third into the, in this song, in uh, Little Wing that is, uh, we, would, we would think to ourselves that we would do, but we wouldn't do it in that way, right? Where we're playing everyone dominant, trying to make sure we can feel that resolution to the major third, we would instead play it as like a... Make sure we can feel the resolution to the minor one or six, however you want to see it. Um, my point in saying this to you is this progression being something along the Oh no, sorry, to see. No, what is it? No. Oh man. That's what it is. To D. Okay, I'm sorry. So the last little bit there is G to F to C to D. Right? And obviously, uh, being on D, we can go, it's pulling back to G, technically, right? Because it's we're on five. If we play a dominant, you really hear it. Right? Uh, but he's doing like a, like a, a D major. To E minor, which is the relative minor G major, so it still has a, a pull to it, right? Anyways, my point in telling you all of this is that when you go and you approach a, a progression, it's important to kind of establish these ground rules first of like what you understand about your progression. For me, that's what I've realized about this one is that it is inherently E minor, uh, but we can kind of play uh, around with G major as well, even. <laughs> Even bringing that minor seven in is not that big of a deal, uh, just based off the fact that when we come up here, we're not really harping on that, on that fact from E minor, right? And if we if we think about this for a second, right? We're not having to play those notes right next to each other, so you're never going to hear that pop out. So it's not that big of a deal. Instead, we could have like a, um, you know, that. I even play the opposite note right there that I should be playing as far as we, what we were just trying to imply in, we were trying to imply that minor seven, because in this case, right, two of our sixth degree of our E minor, the second note of that is actually our major seven of one. Now that's just a fancy way to say this note, if you look at it, both of these notes rather, if you look at them based off of what you're trying to apply them to, right, that is how we would start playing our minor scale based off of E. 
right? Uh, in, in this case, that would be two again, right? Reach our octave, got the two or nine, however you want to see it. Um, but then if I wanted to, as I said, imply that minor seven over the one, right? I would be playing the literal half step away from that, which usually is tough to get together, right? And again, we're not doing, we're not playing them together. So you don't, you don't have that like disjunct sound. It's totally fine if you have them separate in that way. So uh, again, realizing these small little nuances is an, is an important thing before you go and you approach a progression like this. Uh, as you like, hey, okay, well, what do I wanna do? <clears throat> so in this case here for my, this is uh, eight years ago. So this is, um, pretty, I don't want to say early, like I definitely feel like I was in a, I had established my, I probably had established my um, like technique and my ability to play quick things uh, and uh, like what that meant to me and my own uh, picking and things like that uh, pretty early on, uh, probably like 2009 or eight, probably 2008 or nine uh, is when that really uh, got to that point for me where I felt pretty comfortable. Uh, and this is 2015, I think. Yeah, it's 2015, February 2015, right? So I, it had been years that I had felt pretty comfortable with being able to do ultimate picking stuff uh, and string skips and all these things, but I had no other ability to really use uh, anything but major or minor, and I didn't really know anything except for how my finger positions work together uh, in these ways, right? So I could be, I could do all these positions, right? But I didn't know how to really apply them to a lead sound, right? And so this was my first real. Um, uh, and I had told this story already before, so I'm um, sorry if you have to hear me say it twice, but uh, Paul Gilbert, I, had, I joined his school. I had some extra, extra fundage when I was still in the Army, and I joined his school online uh, where you could send in uh, videos of yourself playing, and then he would send you a response. It was really cool stuff, uh, really good insight for me. And uh, I only did it once. However, I... Uh, I remember I sent him the video and it was, uh, or I, I should say, I saw a video of his from another student where he was challenging everybody to do uh, the thing that I'm, I'm talking about today, which is write a solo over an existing progression. Uh, and so I was like, well, I'm gonna do Little Wing. I think he even talked about maybe doing Little Wing. Uh, and so that's what I did. And um, I, I remember approaching the song and being like, oh, I can't just do my, because I can't land on E when we go back to G. Maybe uh, like a, you know, like little things were starting to come out of me that had never really come out of me before as far as like ideas are concerned for like melodies, right? I, at this point, I wasn't just playing my pentatonic box into my minor shapes, into my string skip stuff, like, which is what I was doing before. I was actually trying to think about melodies there within. And this is right uh, when I had really started getting into Guitar Pro. I had Guitar Pro for a very long time, but I was writing in Guitar Pro uh, with this as well. So I sat down and I wrote the whole lead out in Guitar Pro and then taught it to myself pretty much. Like, don't get me wrong, the guitar was in my lap the whole time, but the ideas that I had and stuff were based off of what I could do and get away with in Guitar Pro as far as timing wise. Because Guitar Pro, you can't really put anything in there that's not going to fit, right? So in this case, I played through, through the progression once, uh, which we can skip. So I just played through the progression once here. We'll actually watch it, it's alright. To E, B minor, walk down, to A, G, I'm oh, sorry, C first then G, F, C, Right? So that's the whole progression, and this is what I wrote for it. And then I play pretty much the, the original solo. So approaching that, I sent that in and I felt pretty confident about it, right? But uh, as after I sent that in, he sent me a video back, a long video actually, and he was going over a bunch of stuff about, I talked about uh, thumb placement last time, which is something he brought up with me about trying to keep your thumb up top all the time. Um, but he also said to me that I was approaching this much like a violin player approaches writing a lead, right? Like here's this chord, and then we have this chord, and then we have this chord, and then we have this chord, right? And sometimes it's nice to blend those lines kind of like Hendrix does, right? If you have that progression, which I wonder if I can, let me uh, see if I can get that. I'm gonna try to get that uh, progression going. 
So over this, right? Right, I'm trying to grab notes that exist between. I played technically what was uh, like a G lick, right? And it fits so nicely as I came back in to E minor, right? Um, I was extending that chord that came before into the next chord instead of just boxing these all up into, you know, my minor uh, string skips, which is kind of what I was doing in the video. Uh, I would say this is the first thing to try to think about <clears throat> when you're approaching uh, a new section to write your own lead in. Allow yourself to just play technically in one key, right? For almost all of that, and this was the, my point in doing it, is I was playing in almost only E minor shapes. I played, right? I Maybe I would have brought in, right? Dorian, I guess you can kind of call that. Uh, maybe thinking something like that, right? But I'm still thinking that is all E minor. Now as I'm playing it without anything. And of course there I can hear the, the, the song a little bit because I've I found G, right? In my shape. Right? Same thing with here. I'm thinking only E minor there though. Uh, and so that's how you feel around a progression like that. Uh, is you 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 kind of take the roadmaps of the guitar that you know, right? That you're comfortable with. Maybe it's pentatonic scales, maybe it's just chords, maybe it's uh, three note per string scales, but just find find what fits there for you. If you put it back, if you're doing the same, same kind of thing, if I just went like this. just my E minor scale. Sorry about that. I watched myself too much on the camera. <laughs> I'm just playing the scale. I've, I've, I've connected my positions of six and the octaves and seven. And I've just connected them, right? So I'm just playing over the scale and just kind of letting my ear decide which notes should linger, right? And kind of coming up with like note displacement is a, is a fancy way to say it, but just coming up with like random, maybe we want to start on one. Maybe we start on, on, on something else. It all 
all sounds nice. And I'm just, I'm not, it's not even that I'm making it up as I go. I'm not even trying to do anything particular. It's not even that I'm making it up. I'm literally just thinking about the scale and my ears telling me like, oh, that sounds good. Hang on that for a second. Oh, we could maybe build to this note now. That might sound good, right? That's all that's happening here. Uh, and it sounds, it sounds pretty great. All right, so now for the part of the video, I'm gonna have to mute this part of the video probably uh, after, uh, after I get done here. And it's only because I'm gonna play uh, with a couple songs here that uh, there's really nothing I can do about. I'm gonna try to, I'll try to put in, actually I got one of the holds on one of my videos released because I, uh, did a, I did a, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, I, I disputed the the claim because it was a, it was a Heifetz video where I was talking about a particular piece and all I was doing was using little excerpts of it while I talked about it and tried to show it on guitar and they released it for me, which was really nice. So, uh, keep your fingers crossed. I could do the same thing here, but, um, so to cover, all right. So these two songs are excellent. Now I think this song I'm definitely going to get dinked for though. Uh, cause we can just play with this. Actually, let's do a, uh, back, a backing track for it. Uh, if we can find one. I think I might get in trouble because this one's going to have vocals in it, but that's all right. It's a completely different mixed backing track, and I'll even bring up Chrome with this too. So here is a cool song because this, the reason why it's a cool song, uh, well, for me, is because what I, this is like what I was hearing in my childhood, and it holds a special place for me, but also because uh, it has a really cool, uh, like, uh, like, uh, you couldn't really call it harmonic minor. I guess you can call it like a, a, a um, what do you want to call it? like a substitute chord? Like they're implying harmonic minor technically. They're taking the minor scale and just adding that raise seven uh, back to one, right? Which is technically a harmonic minor thing, but they don't really harp on that fact. They don't give they don't give you like something that would pull you somewhere else, um, such as you would use harmonic minor for, at least in my own uh, my own ways. But um, so this, uh, what is that? Uh, Oh man, I don't think that's what it is. Let's do it again. I guess it is. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, the progression here uh, so we have like a E minor right so that's we would feel these things out and think about them right at first and you'll hear it come in right here right once this uh, very trebly keyboard goes away Now I'm already mapping stuff out here, right? This is the same progression as like 50 other songs that come to mind right now. Like I'm play it's pretty much um it could be uh, all on the watchtower. We also have a That's like Rita's Gone by uh, Marcus King. These certain things that you associate these things with, uh, kind of like I was doing there, are going to allow you to boom. All right, well, I know what's going to fit here if I want to. Uh, and then your job is to try to conform it to the piece at hand, right? So as we have this, right? Like right here, I know where he's going to go now, right? I'm just guessing. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. 
it's the same thing over. So once you establish that vocal pattern, uh, kind of like that, like that was just me guessing. Uh, I had to, I pulled this song up last night and played with it for a minute or two, and I, I'm extremely familiar with this song. Obviously, again, this is like a uh, like one of my favorite songs from my childhood. Uh, but I, 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 there's no way that I, I knew that if the pattern is, he's probably gonna sing that too, which is the same thing in all three octaves, and so that's kind of what I'm relying on here, right? And I knew it was coming. I just didn't know where that raise seven is going to come in. Or maybe. Right? It's going to have that pull back to one. And I knew it was coming. So you just feel it out in your scale. Again, all I'm, all I'm thinking here is those three notes. Sorry. I'm thinking of those three notes every time in scale, uh, or in octaves, I should say, uh, and trying to just find the notes that are around them. And all I'm thinking up here is I know I have, I'm in my D minor shape, right? So I know I can rely on that. And I know how to drag that down. I'm in my pentatonic shape. And I know my... Sorry. I gotta stop watching myself in the in the um, the, the camera. It drives me. Uh, I'm watching myself to see how it looks to make sure you can see my fingers, and then I can't. I just suck at doing that. All right, so let's play with it for a minute. See what we come up with. made a discovery there why can't we why can't we bring we can extend that raise seven and play a my or a diminished scale on it if want to for a nice resolution there boom an idea has made itself available to me so let's just rewind a little bit and give it a try oh i played it i played it in the wrong spot i'm sorry <laughs> these things are a bit bound to happen right I can hear the solo.
another discovery. We have what's called like Lydian here, right? But we don't have to consider it that. We can think about it as dominant too. So. And so I'm already making these little associations and it's just my first playthrough, right? So, and I know, I know I was just jamming there, right? And I'm probably sure I lost all of you, but it's like hard not to lean into that uh, and want to keep doing that. Oh man, I got to go too. It's already 11.45. Jeez. All right. Uh, so this is kind of, it will, I'll, I'll, I talk too much about the pick stuff, uh, but I'll talk much more about this next time. Um, this is, this is exactly what, uh, you know, you kind of want to do is approach it very minimally at first, give the song a listen, try to find little key changes in there and then away you go. Uh, that's that's kind of you know just like let the guitar tell you if you're right or wrong. Uh, just like when I played the diminished scale in the wrong in the wrong, I'm gonna I'm gonna land on the wrong spot. I knew I did right. Uh, and so like you know that you, the guitar tells you instantly you're like, well that wasn't right. I should do that again right. So all right uh, let's do we'll do some uh, waves loop real quick and then I'm out of here just a minute or two. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I will uh, maybe not tonight but probably tomorrow I'll be back on. So no worries. Throw a lick in there, right? Is it like something you're trying to work on? Everybody likes bins.
there's a raw one for you where I did not play very good, but I was just like exploring, you know, like trying to find out uh, what fits, what doesn't. And trust me, we've, we heard plenty of what doesn't fit there. All right, I'll be back uh, tomorrow to talk uh, quite a bit more about all of these things. Please, please, please leave me comments, questions, concerns, anything that you want to talk about. I am totally ready to talk about exactly what you want to talk about. And frankly, I need ideas. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the pick conversation was good today. I think we covered that pretty thoroughly, but I'll talk more about approaching. I have another song that I want to do uh, talking about approaching progressions and what you can possibly do. And uh, maybe we'll like establish a couple of licks that we try to kind of shoehorn in there, which is always fun to do. Uh, but yeah, anyways, I love you all. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out uh, if you are. And if you're watching this back, uh, you are the best. I really appreciate you. You are the reason why I am continuing to do this uh, because it seems like uh, it's helpful. And that's really all I want to do is be able to help people out. Uh, with these things as I was giving uh, a lot of help on YouTube um, when initially when I was first starting guitar and stuff. So uh, I would have liked there to be more, have been more out there when I was starting to answer some of the questions that I was beating my head against the wall and plateauing with for quite some time. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to provide now. So uh, also if you're an advanced guitar player and you have any tips for me, hook me up, bro. <laughs> All right, you guys have a good day. Thank you so much for hanging out. Let me just uh, make sure that I'm not cutting this off too soon as I ramble because inevitably I will get cut off here. Just one second. Por favor. Necesito pensar. Sobre esto. Uh, okay. All right, good. Give the thumbs up and that's where we'll cut it right there. Now we're waiting for it to show. All right, you guys have a good day.